I've done presentations on polity uh, in this group before, and apologizing, apologies for making some of you sit through some of this the second time, although I've shortened some pieces that I've done before. You've heard me before define polity most simply as those stated promises and commitments we make to each other that describe the way we do things around here. That's, uh, that comes from George Brunk III. It's his it's down and dirty definition of polity, sort of this, the way we do things around here. We've been struggling since the beginning of Mennonite Church USA to understand how our polity can work for us. When the matter of polity is raised, we often make a prior choice that generally sets the course for our conversations not going very well. We have a relational tension among us. The trust level uh, is, is low in the room. And so that sends us uh, trying to, to, to turn to our polity to solve the question or the conflict for us. And that usually has us clamoring for former polity commitments in previous denominations. So rather than experiencing the transformation that Mennonite Church USA hoped for at the beginning, expecting things to be different, uh, I think that at points things have, things have been as they were only more so. <laughs> I've observed that our conferences in some cases have regressed into more extreme versions of their former selves, sort of stretching the rubber band a little bit more in the direction of the former polity that they experienced in the former denomination, rather than expecting that something new will happen to all of us in this new denomination. I recall my first executive board meeting uh, almost a little over 11 years ago, and halfway through the meeting, uh, moderator Sharon Waltner did a check-in with board members, going around the room and asking each member uh, what, how, how they were doing and, and what thoughts they were having. And, and when she came to me, I, I blurted out the only thought I had at the moment. I said, well, our conversation to this point has me wondering if the church is primarily a problem that needs to be solved. Well, that was a conversation stopper for the board meeting, it's like somebody farted in the room. <laughs> but I continue to live with that question, is that, you know, in our gatherings, what's going on when we act as though the church is primarily a problem that needs to be solved? I tell this story because I think it demonstrates something about how our approach to polity has evolved. In his book, um, Being Human, Rowan Williams has a chapter entitled, Thinking with Our Bodies, and he writes this quote, inside our heads there is a highly developed lighthouse beam, invisible but not less effective. It swivels around from the interior point and lights up problem after problem, situation after situation. It switches on its full strength and we then activate our capacity in order to solve the particular problem that is proposed to us inside our heads but the lighthouse beam model will consistently persuade us to draw in our horizons to concentrate on function rather than vision. To focus on function rather than vision and will therefore finally make us less recognizably human to one another than we might otherwise be. That sound familiar? Here is what happens when we focus on function rather than vision and we become less recognizably human to one another. We reduce each other, we reduce reality to dualistic extremes, pushing each other to the edges. And it sounds like this. See if you uh, have heard any of these kinds of uh, dualistic ways of thinking. Uh, are we gonna be about unity or uniformity? Yeah. There's a lot of space between those words if you, if you wanna look at them, right? Um, are you gonna be a biblicist or are you gonna be a contextualizer? And there's a lot of space between those two words. Uh, are we gonna focus on congregational autonomy or conference authority? There's a lot of space between those words. Uh, the congregation calls and the conference credentials and those, you act in those silos, right? Uh, I can't read that one here. Uh, that's for conferences to decide. The executive board doesn't control those decisions. So again, pushing things out to the edges. Are we gonna be inclusive or exclusive? We have a messy polity, right? But we tend to push, to, to push each other out into the corners. And I believe we do that in order to protect a vacuum at the center of the room because we are afraid that if anyone is allowed to speak something constructive into the center, someone loses their preferred experience of reality. 
Who can say anything constructive about Mennonite polity in our denomination these days? We want to push each other out to the edges so that we can protect that vacuum at the center because if anybody speaks into that that's not coming from my preferred experience of reality, I'm afraid I'm going to lose my preferred experience of reality. So how can we think about polity in a way that focuses on vision more than function and makes us more recognizably human to one another? Each time we push somebody out to the edge by saying, are you this or are you that? We do this dualistic kind of thinking. Each time we do that, we make that person less human because we reduce what that person cares about to one thing or the other thing. And humans are very complex creatures, right? So we are becoming less recognizable human to one another. So what I want to say now is that polity and all this conversation about polity and, and you know, some of us get jazzed about polity, uh, some of us don't, <laughs> but there, there is, polity is, has relative importance. And what I mean by that is that the best structures and most carefully outlined processes will not save us from low trust and bad relationships. Exactly what you're saying, Michael, right? And we can, we can uh, survive deeply flawed structures and inconsistent processes if relationships are strong and trust level is high. Polity is not the most important thing that the church does. Polity will not save us if we do not have rich relationships and high levels of trust and all the things that Michael is talking about in that, in that pyramid. If we don't work on those things, no polity is going to save us. But a good functional polity will make our life more predictable, enabling us to know what we can expect of one another, and that contributes to a stronger base when the tensions or anxieties or conflicts increase in the church, right? When, when things can be predictable and we know what to expect of one another, that really helps us in those times when, when we're not trusting each other or when trust goes lower. We need a kind of relating to one another that is always moving us into the upper right quadrant. Here I sort of did the, one of these diagrams of, of flawed structures and healthy structures, trust building processes and trust depleting processes. And in so many processes, if we don't commit enough time to one another in the process, we will tend to, to fall into one of the three lesser categories. But how do we think about polity and building our common expectations for one another that are always reinforcing that upper right quadrant of healthy structures and trust building processes? We need a kind of uh, relating to one another that is always moving us into that upper right quadrant when we think about our polity. It's not a means primarily to solve problems. Uh, relational building experiences that move us to healthy structures and trust building problem processes are what we need to focus on. And I think we've been short on both of these in our denomination to this point in our short history. We've been short on structures because of our diminishing capacity as our denomination gets smaller in size. We've been losing capacity in terms of what can support strong, strong structures. And we've been short on process because we have had a hard time prioritizing, committing the time to doing biblical communal discernment. I don't know about you, but I recall a time in CLC when we spent several rounds at CLC talking about the importance of biblical communal discernment, but we went about three years without actually doing it. <laughs> we did that at General Assembly twice in a row, we talked a lot about biblical com communal discernment and the importance of doing that, but couldn't seem to find the time to prioritize the actual doing of it in the presence of one another. Well, just to move on to uh, several uh, classic forms of polity, just to give us a, a framework for how these things are usually parsed. Uh, there is uh, the Episcopal model of polity in which decisions are made by one person or very few people and are passed down to the rest of the community. There's the Presbytery model, which involves extensive consultation between members of the congregations and those who have a leadership role. And there's the Congregational model. Decisions are made by the whole community meeting to discern together or by as many as choose to be involved. Each of these might be shaped by the Episcopal model, a sort of triangle top down, a Presbyterian model that's more of a, of a what do you call that? Trapezoid, Trapezoid? okay, and uh, thank you, <laughs> and uh, a, a circle model. And each of these has its strengths and weaknesses, and, and actually probably very few denominations fall into one of these pure types. We're somehow, somewhere between the Congregational model and the Presbyterian model, although, although trending toward the congregational model. We might uh, 
complexify it a little bit to talk about on the far end sort of a papal model where, where there's this authorized figure at the center that holds the thing together. All kind, the, the strength of that is all kinds of crazy making can happen in the system as long as that, that central figure who's authorized to represent the church sort of stays put. <laughs> um, then then uh, that's sort of on the far extreme of the Episcopal model. Then we have sort of the synod, or, or what you, ref you think of as far as the Lutheran tradition, uh, maybe a little bit more to the Episcopal side than the Presbytery. Then you have the conference system, uh, and, uh, and uh, this you might think of as uh, UCC, maybe, uh, not, not UCC, Disciples of Christ. And then you would have a congregational model, and then clear at the far end, maybe a radical congregationalism. Um, We've often said that uh, Mennonite Church US, uh, Mennonite, the old Mennonite Church was more to the conference side of things and the general conference Mennonite Church was more to the congregational side of things. But I think if you map this, we, when we only talk to ourselves, it feels like we're really far apart on this. But when you put this in the map of the whole Christian tradition, uh, the, the old Mennonite Church and the general conference Mennonite Church were actually quite close together, trending toward the congregational model. If you were to look at the minutes of bishop meetings, if you could access them, you would find how often bishops would tend toward in their decisions, making sure they were reaff reaffirming and, and shoring up the congregations to make their own decisions. And on the general conference side, while you didn't have the bishops, there were uh, traditional, very highly influential individuals who really did set the course for many things. So these two uh, denominations were actually, I think, quite closer than, than we might imagine. Mennonites split in eastern Pennsylvania over, among other things, whether constitutions were appropriate or not for the church that should be guided by the spirit. And that split fed into the, 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 the split that, that created the General Conference and former Mennonite churches. But then on the other hand, we have these confounding situations, like with the Lancaster Conference bishops that at one time spoke against formalized polity. That is, they spoke against keeping minutes of meetings. They thought you shouldn't keep minutes at meetings because it tended to limit the freedom of future decisions. Now, isn't that ironic? Hmm. Yeah, you should all say that. Hmm. Uh, as we have seen, none of these models from, from the left to the right, none of these models has saved any denomination in the West from major fracturing. <laughs> the relative importance of polity, okay? Nevertheless, it's important for us to, to try to build on those um, common expectations, particularly when we are in times of complexity, when we are in times of, of growing diversity, when we are in times of, of confusion, conflict, and tension. Um, the Mennonite Church today is, is certainly increasing in internal diversity, racial, ethnically, uh, economically, and I would say as important as the economic diversity that's happening in our church, I would say the educational diversity that's happening in our church is, is growing probably as fast as any diversity. Uh, I'm told, I've been told enough times that I'm starting to believe it's true, but I haven't done the research myself, but I'm told that the Mennonite church has the highest number of graduate degrees per, per member of any denomination in the country. Now think about where we were at the end of World War II. So in, in two generations, maybe three, this diversity has just exploded. And I think that the increasing diversity of educational level is having as much to do with the tensions in our denomination as, as economic or even racial ethnic. So when internal diversity is increasing and societal complexity is increasing, and I think we'd all agree that that's happening, uh, the need to be explicit about our common commitments increases relationally, right? So the greater our diversity grows in the church, the more complex our society grows, the more time we need to spend being explicit about our common expectations for one another. We make progress in our relational commitments when we recover a common language for what we expect of one another. And as we look at our documents and the initial framers of, of Mennonite Church USA, what they were intending to do was to build a denomination or, or call forth a denomination that was grounded in this language of covenant to describe who we are with God and one another. Now, I'm just gonna look at, I did a whole presentation on covenant a couple years ago, I'm not gonna drag you through all of that, but just to give you four texts that I think are illustrative of, of the nature of covenantal relationships. 
uh, moving to the Genesis 9 passage when uh, God made this covenant with Noah and his sons. As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. This is the sign of the covenant. I have set my bow in the clouds, and bow here is not rainbow, it's bow as in bow and arrow. Okay? I'm hanging up my bow. I'm hanging up my bow. I will never you know, attack the world again. I've set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the, the earth. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it, and I will remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I've established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Listen to the language of all everlasting, everybody, all things, never again. You hear the unqualified nature of this covenant that God is making with the world. Skipping ahead, and I realize I'm running past the Abrahamic covenant and lots of other covenants, but this, these are illustrative of, of the movement of covenant understanding in the scriptures. So in Jeremiah, we have this passage, the days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. Hmm. That first covenant had all these unqualified, eternal, everlasting language in it, but there's a new covenant coming now. I'm, I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. No longer shall they say, teach one another or say to each other, know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. What we see in this passage is that covenants can be replaced. But when they're replaced, the, co the new covenant, the replacement covenant, increases intimacy and vulnerability on God's part. God is taking all the responsibility for the things humans did against the covenant on God's self. God is increasing God's intimacy and vulnerability with people. That's the movement we'll see as the covenants progress. If one replaces another, it moves in the direction of greater vulnerability and intimacy, not, not uh, longer lists of fine print and ex exit clauses. When we get to the New Testament, we see the covenant is, a new covenant is made now through Jesus. Then he took a loaf of bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying this is the cup, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant now made in my blood. This replacement covenant moves us even to greater intimacy and vulnerability. This covenant is now made not by imputing knowledge into human minds or human hearts, but by the taking in of all the human offense in the very body and blood of Jesus. This covenant is now made in body and blood of, of God's Son. And then skipping ahead to Ephesians, where the church is theologizing about the meaning of this covenant, we have this passage in Ephesians 2 uh, that we looked at earlier this morning. Remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the com commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him the whole picture is joined together and grows to become a dwelling so that we become a place where God's spirit dwells in the material world. Now you're gonna be hearing next year at Kansas City from uh, Canadian Mennonite theologian Tom Yoder Neufeld, and I, I cannot wait for you to get these Bible studies that we're gonna have there. We saw them, he gave them to us in, uh, in Kenya uh, in April, and they are, they are stunning. 
But according to Tom Neufeld in his commentary on Ephesians, in the early decades of the church, among all the diversities of the church, gender, age, slaves, masters, nothing was a greater divide than between Jew and Gentile. The spirit, he says, seems bent on blowing things together that don't want to be together. I love that line. In Ephesians, the spirit is bent on blowing things together that don't want to be together. And in this covenant, the spirit is joining together those who don't want to be together into a place where God's spirit comes to dwell in the world. If God was able to join Jew and Gentile together into one body, if God in the covenant established in the cross of Jesus is able to gather up all things in heaven and on earth into oneness, what does that tell us about how we live together and how we participate in this covenant, how we disagree and how we fight? The covenant God established with us in the body and blood of Jesus gathered us up to become the very resurrected body. We are gathered up into this covenant as full participants. We become that very resurrected body present in the world. This is our ecclesiology that needs to inform our polity. And if you look at our documents from the confession of faith to shared understandings of ministerial leadership to the membership guidelines, the common language that is used to describe our relationship is always first and foremost covenant. When we try to manage our disagreements about belief and practice, we need to argue and persuade using the categories and principles of covenant. Michael said, he said it very well today, that when we do polity, we so often stop doing our theological work and we reach for organizational stuff we absorb from our culture and we leave behind this rich, thick tradition of covenant. Strong relationships will not be most basically administrative or political transactions. They will be visceral embodiment until we can recover language that reflects a visceral embodiment for our common life. Our aspirations for unity won't be Christian. Let me say that again. Until we can recover language for our life together that reflects visceral embodiment, that we are gathered up into the resurrected body of Jesus, until we can do that, our common life aspirations for unity will not be Christian. <laughs> well, let's just summarize here before we go to break some characteristics of biblical covenants. First of all, God is the primary actor. Creatures are participants. The covenant is not ours to negotiate. The covenant is not ours to write. God establishes the covenant. God is the primary actor. And if you go back into the Old Testament and look at some of the other covenantal language that God uses, you, you see, uh, like for example in Hosea, Israel is completely passive in the creation of that covenant. God says, I am going to be your husband and you are going to be my wife and I'm just going to lay you down and, and I'm going to do it all for you. God is the primary actor. Creatures are participants. We are gathered up into this covenant as we come to the table of our Lord. Covenants include a declaration and a sign. Uh, there is an announcement, but then there are these signs that memorialize that covenant. For us, those signs are baptism and Lord's table and the covenant that's extended in ordination. We make declarations, we bear witness to what God is doing in our midst, and then we have these signs that we convey. Covenants are holistic. It's a melding of lives, not just interests. The covenant that God is making is this all-inclusive, gathering up all things into one. It's not just about God's interests or your interests. It's about a melding of lives. Covenants enfold persons into a peoplehood. So as Tom, said, Tom Neufeld says, if the Spirit is always blowing together those things that don't want to be get together, what are we saying to God when we say, I can't be with this group anymore, I need to go be with this group over here? Are, you know, how long will we flail against this wind that is trying to blow together those things that don't want to be together? Participants in covenants close their exits. And I don't want to overplay the marriage covenant, but it's about the only covenant we have left in our culture apart from the church. 
But, you know, there are reasons why we stand at the altar and say, uh, I do to better or worse, rich or poor, sickness and health. Covenants are all encompassing, enduring, and irrevocable. You never see God making this covenant and saying, uh, here it is, I'm going to rip it out from under you. I'm just, I'm all in. God says, I'm just, I'm all in. And when you break it, well, then we have to make a new covenant, but it's going to draw me close. I'm going to, I'm going to take the initiative to draw closer to you. I'm going to become more intimate and more vulnerable in the next, co in the next covenant we make. So these covenants are all encompassing, enduring, and irrevocable. And again, as I said, when covenants are replaced, it is for the purpose of increasing interdependence and vulnerability. Most basically, our de declarations are our promises. Yes, we've said some of these things in bylaws, and I know not everybody gets jazzed about bylaws, but, but we record these expectations of one another on paper, so we remember them. But bylaws only are, are the signs of our promises only to the extent that they support the promises we've made as participants in the covenant of God that God initiated in Jesus, the promises we made in our baptism, the promises we made in our ordinations, the promises we make to one another when we come to the Lord's table. And what I am continually amazed at is that when we experience tension and pulling away in our church and realignment, how seldom we reference the promises we've made to one another in our baptisms, the promises we've made to one another in our ordinations, the promises we've made to one another every time we come to the Lord's table. Where is that language? Where are those categories when we're uh, talking about our, uh, our troubles with each other? So I offer um, this uh, working definition of covenants. A covenant is a commitment to a holistic and enduring relationship based on unconditional promises and memorialized in signs. Now, I think some things that Michael said are really helpful in terms of uh, how we leave our theological work behind when we do polity and we tend to move into organizational, structural kinds of things and, and we leave the spiritual side of, of our life behind us. And I'd like to set up for you uh, um, this dichotomy here because I think that um, we've absorbed a lot in our society that, that shapes us to enter into to understand all of our relationships as contractual rather than covenantal. And here are some common characteristics of a contractual relationship. Individuals choose and create community as they deem necessary. Contractual relationships foster a union of interests. For example, is this church going to help me grow or meet my needs? Or in business, contracts that, that I enter into because it's going to make me, it's going to enrich me. It's going to, it's going to do something that I need. Contractual relationships locate religious authority and accountability in an individual's personal relationship with God. I'm, I'm in this relationship with this church, and then I'm taken out of this relationship with this church if my personal uh, relationship with God is being affected. And contractual relationships are conditional. If the community ceases to meet my needs, the relationship is legitimately nullified. How many of you have ever bought property with a mortgage? Uh, lucky few of you apparently have it. Lucky. Okay. If you've ever brought, bought property with a mortgage, how many signatures does it take to, to, to seal the deal? How many? 50? 75? Yeah, something like that. Right. How many signatures does it actually take to buy the property? One. There's one signature on the, on the mortgage that gets you the mortgage. Every other time you sign that paper, you're signing uh, an agreement to make sure that if either party feels the need to get out of this relationship, they can, okay? There's like 50 or 60 signatures that are all about how do we get out of this thing legitimately if we need to. Look at covenantal relationships by contrast. The community is the choice and gift of God. God is the primary actor. God is the first actor in covenant making. We are participants. It's the choice and gift of God. Covenantal relationships foster a union of persons. We give of our very selves to each other, and once given, it can't be neatly retracted. I, mean, I often use this silly little example uh, with, with married couples when I was pastoring in a local congregation. 
you take a blue and a yellow Lego block and you put them together, right? That's one, that would be a contractual version of marriage. They can be snapped together and snapped apart. But you take yellow water and blue water and mix them together. Now, how do you extract yellow and blue? They're both still there fully. But how do you extract one from the other? This is a covenantal understanding of relationships. Covenantal relationships locate authority and accountability in the church's mutual discernment. And covenantal relationships are unconditional, grounded in the self-giving, steadfast love of God. Now, I've been doing some following of how news reports have been done over the last number of years when congregations and conferences are going through realignment or leaving, which column, the, the language of which column do you think shows up most in those news reports that, that describe the rationale for why these decisions are being made? It's almost entirely contractual language. I mean, do the study yourselves, it's fascinating. You can find all the news reports on MCUSA News Service, right? Look at that. I mean, and, and I'm not saying that's MCUS News Service's fault, right? It's like this is the language people are bringing to the report. These are the quotes. Do a search on that, and you'll find that the contractual language is, is used for the, as the rationale for why this decision must be made. So I impose an important question to you. Um, what would our disagreements look like if we assume the second column of commitments, a covenantal basis? for the nature of this relationship than a transactional or contractual one. I don't think it means we fight any less. <laughs> I don't think it makes disagreements magically disappear, but it changes how we fight with each other. It changes how we disagree. And it changes what we assume about the outcome uh, before we even get started, right? This is what the church has said when it last spoke as the church. Right? This is a fun question to ask in a group. Who speaks for Mennonite Church USA? Right? <laughs> That's a hard conversation if you really want to dig into it. But when a, did not, when a confession of faith has been adopted by an entire denomination, we can say this is what the church has said when it last spoke as the church. In a certain sense, all confessions once adopted are dated. Right? This is what the church has said when it last spoke as the church. What would the church say if it spoke as the church today? It might change, right? So we are always living in this liminal space between when the church last spoke as the church and what the church will say when it next speaks as the church. And in between, we have the lived experience of the faith. But that doesn't mean the confession of faith can be disregarded or the accusation that it's functioning as canon law. That's another one of those, those places we drive everyone to the edge, right? Well, you're, 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 you're disregarding the confession of faith. Oh, you're trying to make it canon law. There is so much space between those extremes for us to talk about, right? So we think about these, uh, this purpose of the confession of faith. It provides guidelines for the interpretation of Scripture. And I would say our article on Scripture is one of the, one of the best. I mean, it's a tremendous. Uh, I would lay that down against any tradition's uh, statement on Scripture. It's excellent. Uh, our confessions provide guidance for belief and practice, but again, not, it says explicitly not to replace the lived experience of the faith. This is where we are similar to uh, non-reformed Baptists who say we're, we're always looking for more light. Right? We're always looking and expecting there to be more light. Third, they provide a foundation for unity within and among other churches. So again, thinking about your local or your, your, uh, your traditional uh, participation in this covenant in this church that is one expression of the Christian community. This confession of faith gives us an opportunity, uh, a basis for which we enter into conversation with the rest of the Christian church, including Mennonite World Conference and, and at the National Council of Churches and World Council of Churches and other, other uh, larger bodies. The confession of faith provides uh, instruction. Uh, it's for instructing new members and for sharing information with inquirers. It provides an updated interpretation of belief and practice in the midst of changing times, and it provides help in discussing Mennonite belief and practice with other Christians and people of the faiths. Now, there are some things that this introduction doesn't promise you that confessions do, and I would say here's what confessions don't do. 
Confessions do not try to define hard boundaries. And I think um, Daryl Guter and, and before him Paul Hebert, who were introducing to us the idea of centered set understandings of church rather than boundaried set, and lots of you have worked in these areas, uh, that confessions of faith really are suited for the centered set approach to church uh, life. That, that we are trying to articulate something that is at the center. Now, one of the things that uh, I think Alan uh, Hirsch, his wife's name, Deb, Deb Hirsch, talks about is the importance of having, they say, guardians of the center in any church. I would say stewards of the center in any church. And, and I think we've, we've been a little bit lax or lapsed in that. In a sense, maybe this room represents the stewards of the center in our church. Like, how are you stewarding what we say is at the center of our church when it comes to implementing and, and uh, activating our common commitments? Confessions do not try to serve as a shortcut for congregations in their biblical discernment on matters of faith and life. It is not acceptable to slam down the confession on the table and say, here's what the confession says. Now, do, you know, this is the way walk ye in it. You, every congregation must constantly be doing its biblical communal discernment. And I would say every regional body needs to be doing that. And I would say every national body needs to be doing that constantly. Confessions seek to achieve consensus rather than enforce it. There's this great quote that comes from a, a Dutch leader in 1686, it's probably from the liberal side of the Anabaptist tradition. He says it this way, we should gladly use this confession for teaching and instruction, but not as a scale upon which to weigh our brothers and sisters, we would say. So confessions are not just for, are, are, are for teaching and instruction, not just for teaching and instruction on the parts we like. It is always essential that we talk about what the church has said when it last spoke as the church. Good teachers, Good teachers in the church will present this material in ways that honors the spirit that was leading the church then, even as we believe the church is leading us now. Then we can move on to where there are disagreements, where there is confusion, where we are still waiting for God to make all things clear to us, even as we hold on to what we've already attained, as Paul says in Philippians, right? So what I'm saying in that is that we have to believe that the same spirit that was leading the church to former decisions is the spirit that is leading us today. And so an important place for us to start in our discernment is can we reconstruct the rationale that led the church to, a reasonable, to, to the place that it was as a reasonable position in the past? Can we start with that before we just leap over uh, to, to new understandings and innovation? Again, I take you back to the relative importance of polity, because when polity is reduced to regulating behaviors rather than focusing on mission and vision, when we focus too much on function and problem solving and not enough on vision and mission, we lose a, a great gift in our tradition. Lois Barrett has said this in, in Without Spot or Wrinkle. Church discipline must have the same goal as evangelism and the discipling process, that is bringing people into closer relationship with God through Christ. Now listen to the next part. When the church loses sight of the missional purpose of church discipline, such discipline either becomes harsh and punitive, we've seen examples of that in our history, or weak and non-existent, we've seen examples of that in our history. In neither case will people be brought into right relationship with God and within the church. Polity in a covenantal embodied model keeps discipleship toward union with Christ the highest priority of what we're doing with what the church has said. The highest priority of the church's mission rather than a means of controlling and reinforcing uniformity. When our polity work loses track of that priority, the priorities of vision and mission and, and bringing people into union with Christ, we don't solve the problem. We become less recognizably human to one another and we, in fact, lose our vision and our mission entirely. Ironically, the Mennonite church, when it doesn't keep discipline in proper perspective, loses the mission of effective discipleship. Does that strike you as a problem for this tradition? <laughs> if we lose the mission of effective discipleship? Well, let's talk then about a constructive model of polity. Uh, this comes from George Brunt III, I thought gave us a very good um, uh, glimpse of how Mennonite polity is developed. 
He says there are three distinct epochs in Anabaptist history characterized by three values. The first, he says, from the 17th century to the early 20th century is preservation. Lots of the writing is about how do we codify, how do we, to preserve what this Anabaptist tradition is really about. And from 1940 to 1970, the, 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 the label is identity, and this is where Bender's doing his work, and it's really trying to articulate or crystallize this, take all the polygenesis of Anabaptism and, and crystallize it into this one single thing, which he himself said was in, in, inadequate. But it has to do with identity. These are my people, right? It's identity. But from the 70s forward, the focus, and you can just see it in the theologians who are writing, it becomes about ethics, or we might say relevance. Relevance, ethics, and mission. How do, for example, uh, lots of our theologians who experienced post-World War II reconstruction and all the devastation that occurred in that war and the wars following, Korean War, Vietnam War, began to say, how do we live in this world with this evil around us? And they began to write from a Mennonite perspective on, on ethics and mission, so relevance. Now, this is a linear unfolding of Anabaptist history and how it shaped polity. But as I was, I, I taught George's class at EMS uh, several years, for several years after he retired. And so I asked him the question, what happens if we take that linear unfolding of these three epochs and we bend them into each other into a tr and put them in relationship with each other? What happens when we put these epics in conversation with one another? When, when we do that, we discover a model that helps us understand that these commitments, tacit or overt, are more influential in our discernment than our structures or polity. So we hold all three gifts in tension and keep them in conversation with each other. When you do that, you begin to mitigate the problem-solving things. You begin to mitigate that over-concentration uh, on problems and function and you necessarily start talking about a constructive vision for the church. For example, when you look at identity and mission, but you exclude preservation, you have the mission of my wife's parents who went to Costa Rica under Rosedale. I'm not, I'm not making a judgment about Rosedale. It's, this is a different time and place. But they went to Costa Rica, and they were going to put coverings on the Tico women. And my, my uh, wife's mother was, was uh, teased on the streets because she was pulling a... a pushing a stroller without wearing a wedding ring, right? And so it was about this identity and mission, but they weren't focusing on, they, they lost track of the intended purposes of not wearing wedding rings, for example, or what this covering was really supposed to be about. Or when we look at preservation and mission, but we exclude identity, it gives birth to radical fundamentalism. The, the preservation and mission, when those are the only things you're focusing on, the witness becomes defensive. Mission can become easily coercive then. Uh, but when you hold all three of these in tension, you welcome the gifts of each stage of history rather than jettison the parts you don't want to deal with. This leads to the most reliable discernment, it seems to me, in matters of faith and life. Next time you're working on a difficult issue or facing a divisive problem in your congregation or conference, consider the matter from all three of these points and then putting them in conversation with each other, and you'll be surprised at where that takes you in a more constructive approach than deconstructive approach. Now, our foundational documents were drafted to take seriously identity preservation and mission, I believe, not divide us into silos where each part sort of peers over the fence at the other, and every engagement over the fence is seen as inappropriate intrusion. I've been on the executive board for 12 years almost now, and, and I can tell you that's... <laughs> <laughs> That's how it feels, right? We sort of peer over the fence from the national church to the conference and the conference to the congregation, and we peer over the fence, and, and every, every uh, engagement over the fence is, is, is seen as inappropriate intrusion or, or meddling. You just get a backlash of that immediately. It's something reflexive in us that does that. But our foundational documents, including confession of faith, membership guidelines, a shared understanding of ministerial leadership, ground all relationships in the church in the theological, ecclesiological concept, back again, of covenant. The framers of these documents did not anticipate a church where the parts transact their business and where pragmatism trumps principle. I have yet to hear a conference leader make a credible case that argues away the expectations in our shared understanding of ministerial leadership from a covenantal perspective. I've heard conference leaders try to argue them away from a contractual perspective, but I've not heard uh, someone making the case for arguing away the expectations of our shared understanding 
from a covenantal perspective. When we start to deconstruct the commitments of these documents, leaders are usually moving into transactional or pragmatic territory rather than covenantal territory. I suspect that our disagreements hinge on how much autonomy congregations are granted in their leadership discernment processes, but the pol polity statement indicates that congregations do not have the last or even the most important word, for example, in confirming the call of set-apart leaders. Let me just give you an example from the language of our, of our um, document, of our polity document, that mm -hmm. indicates that we should not be thinking in terms of peering over the fence at one another when we're making these decisions. The covenantal language embedded in a shared understanding of ministerial leadership articulates minimum rather than comprehensive expectations. Notice the language about the meaning of ordination. When the church ordains a man or woman to leadership ministry, it intends to say at least the following. And then there are enumerated things that follow that. It intends to say at least these things. And notice here that it's the church that does the ordaining, not the area conference. The area conference is the agent that bestows the covenant, but the covenant is between that person who is ordained and the church. That person is given an office that is representative, not of the conference or the congregation, but of the church. Our document, the genius of our documents, which is also what confounds us so much, <laughs> is that our documents are always pre very precise in using the word congregation, area conference, and church. And they always mean exactly what they say when they use any of the three of those. We tend in our casual conversation to be rather, rather slippery about that, right? We talk about the church, we talk about the conference, we talk about the congregation. But our documents are very precise when they talk about each of those labels. Rooting our relationships and covenants should save us from running to the corners of how our polity is implemented. How often have you heard the question, are, are these documents a binding policy or general guidelines? Have you heard that? Yeah. Right. Parsing out whether a document is a policy or a guideline will not lead us toward greater attention on vision and mission. For those of you who are married, uh, try applying the dualistic categories of policy and guidelines to your marriage next time you're in conflict with your spouse. Oh, honey, let's see how our policy or our guidelines might say about that matter. <laughs> Neither of those options ends well. <laughs> the answer to the hard questions is found in how all parts of the dynamic covenant, congregation, conference, and church, honor the nature of the church and advance the mission of the church. When we argue that a statement is non-binding or up to the conferences to implement or for congregations to do as they please. We are arguing against the grain of the statements. But my question is, where are the forums for that conversation? It seems to me like this would be a good one. But I confess as moderator and at one time chair of CLC, I didn't find very many enthusiastic partners who were interested in spending our time doing that work here. Our bylaws actually have done a pretty good job of describing the ways the parts stay in dynamic interaction. There's a handout on your table, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time with this. And quite frankly, I did this pretty fast, and it needs to be tested. So that's why I made it a handout. You can look at it, and you can say, wow, this is terrible. It needs to be changed all you want to. But I think, I think this is the first time that anyone has actually put on paper the differing kinds of accountabilities that our bylaws uh, outline for our church. So it's a first try, okay? And I did it myself, it wasn't done communally, so you all work at it and see how you'd like to change it. But I think it's, it's important for us to begin to do this kind of work because if you reviewed all of the minutes of CLC from the very first meeting, which I did and enjoyed it, um, and you did a keyword search, of all of the language and all of our minutes, of the, of the sort of meaty and, and substantial words, terms that come up in our minutes, authority comes up about as, much, as, about as often as any word does. And usually it's in the context of a rhetorical question that doesn't get answered. Like, what if, who's in authority? Where does authority rest in this church? You know, who, who, who has the authority to say that or this? You know? So authority is a big uh, juggernaut. <laughs> for our denominations. So I've tried to lay out the differing aspects of the leadership 
for the different parts of the church. And now as soon as you do this on a table, you're, you're prone to say, well, there you go, putting it all into pieces all over a table and separating everything out. But if you look across, for example, the authority line, what you see is this constant weaving back into the other. The, the congregational authority, account authority is that membership determination and local missional direction. The conferences work at polity implementation uh, and, and credentialing uh, conferral. And CLC, the polity interpretation and, and uh, application. So CLC and conference and congregation are all to be in, in constant interaction with each other. And the executive board describes uh, as derivative, their authority is derivative as described by the delegate, as ascribed by the delegate uh, assembly. And the delegate assembly's authority is sort of sovereign and directive and, and convening. But who are they sovereign for and who are they directive and who are they convening? You know, it's the other parts of the church. We have both congregational and conference delegates to our delegate assembly, right? And so these things are always folded back into each other. And I think there's genius in that in our bylaws that we don't always take seriously. We would rather go back into our fences and peer over the fence at each other and then complain when we're intruding. But, but really, there's a much more dynamic relationship that was conceived. And so maybe it looks more like this. The covenantal relationship described in our documents are meticulous in talking about congregation, the conference, and the church, not to create siloed sectors of influence and positional authority. Instead, the covenant imagines a dynamic relationship that keeps all parts of the church folded into one another so that they can embody a vision of being the body of Christ as a Mennonite expression of the Christian faith. Now, a, a resource that I've recently looked at uh, online, you can find this on the Anabaptist Mennonite Biblical Seminary website under scholarship. It's a, a sermon that was written by Gail Gerber Kuhns of the study of the Council of Jerusalem, seeking to resolve the controversy over the requirement of circumcision. At the end of her paper, she makes these points that I think reflect, are, are reflected very well in our bylaws and the way we describe our church. She says, the decision regarding circumcision was made by local congregation, was not made by local congregations alone, either in Jerusalem or Antioch, but in conversation and discernment at what we would call a conference level. This is not just of strategic importance, but is a matter of the nature of the church and the gift of the Holy Spirit. A local congregation is not in itself the body of Christ. The spirit of Jesus was given to the church, a body that extends far beyond any one congregation or denomination. This suggests that if we truly want to allow the Holy Spirit to work on and in us, we need to value and engage the larger body of Christ, including interchurch and global levels, as we proceed in local decision-making on matters that impact the whole church. In this way, we open the way for the Holy Spirit to transform us and others beyond our imagining. She poses these questions. How much time and energy are we willing to invest in deep listening and engagement beyond our local congregations? How much time are we willing to invest in deep listening and engagement beyond our local congregations? And that requires answering a second question. What are the underlying essentials that we can agree to honor together? And what are we willing to agree to compromise? Gail Gerber Kunz's point is that the outcome of the Council of Jerusalem was really a compromise decision. What are we willing to agree to compromise? When have you participated in discernment around the question with all of the parts of the church present and fully engaged? question for you to think about. When we're facing times of high tension and disagreement and conflict in our church, uh, George Brunk gives us some, some uh, suggestions. Uh, I'll offer these as suggestions to test with the group here. He suggests that we should stay connected to the moorings of our tradition when we are in conflict with each other. That is, go back to what the church has said when it last spoke as the church, and can you understand the rationale for coming to that place? It's good to stay connected to the moorings of our tradition. Secondly, we adopt a posture of faithfulness in the absence of emerging consensus, what Paul said in Philippians. When you disagree about anything, God will make that clear to you. Hold on, only hold on to what you've already attained. Or as Tom Neufeld will say next summer, 
his, his definition for Galassenheit is relaxing into God. How much relaxing into God do you feel, do you see in our church, right? In our times of disagreement, can you relax into God, trusting that God will make these things clear to us? The third suggestion I think we see in the, uh, in the decision of Mennonite Church Canada in the, at the end of their being a faithful church process, that is it, is it appropriate to create a space for the moral character of an innovation to play itself out? So Mennonite Church of Canada said, our confession of faith where Article 19 is concerned is our normative understanding, and there are those among us who will experiment, and we will see that as experimentation, and let that play itself out. Question. And fourth, learning to live with, we need to learn to live with self-contradiction which is not the same as resorting to moral relativism or imposed uniformity or division. In the possibility of new light emerging, we can remain committed to the moorings of our faith while at the same time allowing space for the moral character of innovation to play itself out. We learn to live with self-contradiction while not sinking into relativism, anything goes. And I think that's what the church was doing when it adopted the two resolutions at Kansas City forbearance and the membership guidelines. That was a very confusing decision for the delegates. I get it, I get it. That was a difficult, confusing decision. We felt it from, from the delegates, right? But I believe the resolution on forbearance asked all parts of the church to offer grace, love, and forbearance to one another as each in different ways seeks to be faithful to our Lord Jesus Christ on matters related to same-sex relationships. The resolution on the membership guidelines reaffirmed that the membership guidelines adopted by the delegates in 2001 and updated in 2013 would continue to serve Mennonite Church USA as the guiding document for questions regarding church membership and same-sex relationships or marriages alongside the confession of faith in a Mennonite perspective. There's self-contradiction in that, but we would also say that describes the tension very well that we're living in. And so I think, personally, I think the adoption of both of those guidelines uh, both of those resolutions was reflecting where the church was, describing a tension that we were trying to live in. So, think about those, just as suggestions. I, I'm not sure that I'm ready to recommend that this, is, this is, would be a way forward in times of, of d disagreement and conflict, but these are good suggestions for us to ponder, I think. 